Hello there. Happy Monday. Happy Monday, friends. It's Easter Monday. Lovers. Yes, Easter Monday. Well, what? well it's April 1st. You can be whatever the hell we want it to be. <laughs> Folks, thank you for joining us. We're glad you are here. If you are here, I know I have a couple of people who just can't watch on Mondays, and that's okay. If you're going to have to catch it later, more power to you. But I do see, I do see Paul, ego sum ergo edifiso. Yes, the builder is in the chat. Glad that you are here tonight, as well as Christopher Smith, who says, cue the bass. Absolutely. Robin, thank you for coming back. I saw a few of you in the chat, like after the fact, yesterday. Sorry, but yes, health conditions, which I won't even get into, or maybe we will. Uh, a delay. One day delay. Cool. Different. Monday. It's Monday. It's Monday, April 1st. It's funny. I've got notes here for Sunday, March 31st. A couple of these are irresistible, and I'm going to have to, because I'm going to use them to tie everything what together, is this? What does as this we say? always do. So um, but so we just want to announce that we're going to be uh, converting to Catholicism. We're converting to Catholicism. And, yep, this one says right here. And Oh, uh, you're giving a spoiler alert. Yeah, I was going to save that for later. <laughs> We have Christian <laughs> friends, and I feel like they've been alienated. And uh, Actually, that was just an April Fool's thing. Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, maybe for you. We'll see. We'll see by the time we get to the end of this. But yeah, it's April 1st. April 1st. And that's why I'm wearing my pink shirt. Mm. You objectivists know what pink shirt means, right? If not, <laughs> we'll get into that, too. But first, I want to go back ask, in time. Ask us in the chat, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Ask us in the chat. I don't have anybody on the... Oh, here we go. Okay, Monica's on the Facebook side. And, uh, oh yeah, Robin is in and Greg is here. Excellent. On the YouTube side, Paul, Christopher, everybody. Um, and if you got any AMA action, you know, ask me anything, or American Medical Association, <laughs> feel free to put it in the chat. I'm just going to go back and... I've got just a couple of on this dates, because most of them were prepared for yesterday. But on this date, April 1st, Jane Austen declines the Royal Librarian's writing advice. Okay, I'm trying to catch up on classics. You know, you folks, you have helped us. Best audience in podcasting, y'all are the best. You have helped us catch up on some classic films. Films that we had never seen before. Uh, if Jim Ashley was in the audience right now, we'll catch up with him later. He always has good suggestions, but any classic films that we might not have seen. And that's cool. We saw, you know, Breaker Morant on Jim's advice. We've seen a lot of films on y'all advice. But I'm also trying to catch up on literature. I went to public school. <laughs> and I learned good. I got good learning. <laughs> I learned language real good. And again, for our folks in, in the UK and probably all around Europe, public school isn't school that um, the public provides privately. They call that private school in the United States. No, I went to a school, government schools, I think is the, the approved objectivist term. Yeah, you know what I, I learned in government schools? What did you learn? That I have to uh, do, I have to learn by myself, and I have to learn everything just well, by my own, yeah. uh, my own, my own program, my own time, my own, you know, self-learning. That, that was the real lesson is, if you want to learn something, <laughs> learn it on your own. Yeah. Oh, Apollo Zeus is in the house too. Awesome. So I learned, you know, we read Lord of the Flies. Mm. <laughs> That's the kind of literature that we read in high school. And, you know, we read some of the classics. Or we read some, I had a class that was fantasy and science fiction. That was kind of cool. We read for, Fahrenheit 451. You know, good dystopian literature. I can't remember if we read it in 1984 or Brave New World in that class. But there was a point at which the teacher gave us an optional assignment at the end. So I picked from any of these three books, and she gave three books. And one of them, and the one that I read on the advice of a friend of mine who said, oh, you got to pick that one, was The Fountainhead. So props to Mrs. Pierce, Southfield High School, class of 81. But other than that, I never, oh. I never read Dickens. Pro props to Zyga Hauserman, my French teacher, who had the virtue of selfishness on her shelf. And uh, and I saw that, and I thought, ah, oh, I'm sure this is about Nietzsche, because, you know, Frederick Nietzsche, I always talked about selfishness. <laughs> I opened it up, I'm like, this ain't about Nietzsche. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so easy to plant those seeds. <laughs> and some people go further than that. You've heard our interview with Sean Albert at the Henry Ford Academy, who actually teaches Ayn Rand as part of both economics, history, and 
you know, the, he's not teaching literature, but her literature as well. Yeah. Too cool. Yarnbrook was just there speaking. In fact, I've got a hidden video of his appearance. Ask me about that privately if you want to see. Yarn Brooks speaking before high school students. Man. Yes. And this is a charter school, meaning a public school. It's not a private school. Too cool. So I'm catching up. I'm catching up on the things they never had me read in high school and that I, for better or for worse, didn't have the initiative to learn on my own. Right now I'm reading Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. You know, the only Dickens story I'd ever read all the way through was A Christmas Carol, which is a great read. Has it lived up to your expectations? <laughs> great Expectations is living up to my expectations. It's interesting because it starts, uh, this story starts with uh, the young man Pip, the character. And because it starts out as a story of a young person, I, I immediately go to Frances Hodgson Burnett. And of course, I've read several novels by her, often considered a children's author, but some of the books that I've read, this is adult fiction. And this has got the same kind of adventure to it. Now, Dickens, being a bit of a socialist, he's he's... He's not just critical of the rich. He's critical of all classes. Mm. He, he gives everybody a hard time. It's, um, but he also elevates everybody, or at least the characters that he, uh, he, he wants to elevate. So yes, good book. Recommended. Um, and just like the last couple of novels, that I, older novels that I've read, I can recommend this to you. If, you. if you start reading it, you can read it online. Anything that's out of copyright, anything that's usually anything that's over 75 or 100 years old, you can find those at Project Gutenberg, which has every non-copyrighted or out-of-copyright book ever written, or just about. But you can also find them at their sister site, LibriVox, which has free audiobooks of all of these. And if it's out of copyright, you can also find them at bookstores, usually pretty cheap. So, you know, our Barnes & Noble, which is the chain that we have around here, around Motown, they, uh, you know, they publish their own hardcover or softcover editions, reasonable prices because they're out of copyright, uh, but it's it's their own. So, you know, you spend $15 on a book like this, and it's cool to be able to read the Dead Tree version, the version on paper. Mm -hmm. And I recommend it. I recommend doing all three. You'd be like, well, I'll get it on Audible. That's cool. But sometimes you hear it on Audible and you miss stuff. You don't even know what... Yeah, we're going back to 1980s, 1800, why am I saying 1980s? 1800s English, and there are words there that if I didn't read it on the page, I wouldn't have understood what was said. I recommend all, like, all of like, them. Like totally and tubular and gag me with a spoon. Now, that was the 1980s, oh, which okay. was the last great <laughs> decade, the last great decade of optimism. <laughs> so, yes. this was the day when Jane Austen declined the Royal Librarian's writing advice. Uh, it's it's funny. She got a letter from the Reverend James Stanier Clark, the librarian to England's Prince Regent. Now, this is the future King George, George the Fourth, suggesting she write an historic romance. That's interesting. My notes here say a historic romance. I think we talked about that last week. Why do we say an historic? Well, because H is a vowel. H is a vowel. Sometimes. Really. Kind of. It's play acting. You can do that on April 1st. And it's funny because Jane Austen wrote back to the Reverend James Stanier Clark, the librarian to the Prince Regent. She said, I could not sit down to write a serious romance under any other motive than to save my life. She wrote this in 1816 on this date, April 1st, after she had already written Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice and Emma. So... I actually have to catch up on Jane Austen. I'll be hitting some of those novels, too. Now, if you have any suggestions for old novels, old old books, that you may think I've already read, but there's a good chance that I haven't, It's I'm catching up. You know, I've yeah, read... I'd like to know this, too, because I'm in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, the classics kind of... Uh, I yeah. mean, I, I, I learned about the classic th classics through the movie adaptations. That's true. <laughs> Basically. That's true. I saw the uh, 1950 version, which is the best version, uh, Jose Ferrara's Cyrano de Bergerac mm -hmm. yes. before I ever read the, the play. And part of the problem, too, with, with classic stories like that is once you find one that you really love, you read it over and over again. So I don't know how many times now I've actually read Cyrano, uh, not in the original French, but uh, the, uh, the great translation by Brian Hooker. Mm, yeah. And uh, if I've read that book, five times, maybe more, 
that means I, what I should have done is I should have read it once and then read four other plays. So help me. Help me out. What should I catch up on? Greg Lewis says, War and Peace or Moby Dick? Well, I mean, I mean Great Expectations is over 500 pages. So I was about to say, what are you trying to do here? But some books are longer than others. Maybe that is a good idea. Uh, Apollo says Jane Austen is good. Yes. Th- that's where I need to go. I don't know where to start. Probably Sense and Sensibility. Uh, I've seen adaptations. <laughs> but... You know, you, you you watch these movies and then you read the book and you're like, oh my God, the book has everything I wished the movie had. You know, as great as Jose Ferrar is, there's only so much you can put in a movie. But then you read Cyrano de Bergerac and you're like, oh, the plot makes so much more sense and the actions are so much more heroic understanding the full context. Mm, yes. Oh, by the way, we've got um, uh, Steve um, in the uh, Facebook chat. And he says... Anthem was part of his kids' American Studies class. That's really cool. And uh, the the man with the really regal name, Jose Roberto Briones Hernandez, uh, <laughs> <laughs> says, Anthem is my favorite novel. Uh, Jose, when you pronounce your name, you should have... Um, you know, a hat with a big white plume, and you should, after each each word you say, <laughs> you should sweep the floor with your hat <laughs> and announce yourself in that way. So cool. Ah, most excellent. Um, also on this date, it's Jeff Porcaro's birthday. Now, we lost Jeff Porcaro, one of the great drummers, the great session drummers. Mm. Uh, of course, he was the drummer with Toto. Which brings me back to, we were just doing karaoke night before last. Everybody yeah. should sing. I've told you before. It was so much fun. My post-it note of the week has been the word sing, and probably should do that again today. Everybody you, should sing. You know the best feeling when you're doing karaoke is if you, you've, if you say you know a song, you, you've heard it like dozens and dozens of times, and you think to yourself, you know what? I wonder if I can do that on karaoke. And sometimes it doesn't always work, <laughs> but when it does, and you've never actually sang before, you've never even um, practiced it, and you go up there and you think, boy, that's a lot of lyrics, but I'm going to try to do it. And you do it, and it actually works. And it has it's just so fun when you have this sense of accomplishment. Too cool. And it gets back to, why is Robert wearing a pink shirt today? We'll get to that, but... <laughs> One of the tricks to karaoke is you need to karaoke with supportive friends, family, lovers. Be with people who, no matter what you do, will, they'll have a big smile on their face. Even if they're laughing, they may be laughing at you, but they're also laughing with you. Sing. I've got somebody near and dear to me who will not sing in public, will not sing karaoke. This person is very self-conscious, and it breaks Some, my someday heart. Someday, this person will. They'll get old enough and they'll say, "Ah, oh, frick it, man. Who cares? Right. When anybody, I don't care what anybody says or thinks. So I'm just going to do it. <laughs> Craig says to go with the pink bunny ears. I wish I had the pink bunny ears. They're mm. somewhere in storage. Well, we do have. We have. Do we did but this? But you, you painted this. <laughs> I think it looks better on you than me. And it, well, it doesn't go with the hat. I don't know. It's a problem it's pretty there. good on you, Robert. Yeah. With your shirt. Yeah. I like it. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's cuter on you, but then everything is Yay. cuter on you. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. So, yes, yes, but no, that's not why the pink shirt. We'll get into that. I have to tease you a little bit with that one, but happy birthday well, to the late, but happy birthday to the late Jeff Porcaro. I mention him because he's amazing. A lot of people don't realize he drummed on everybody's albums. We've talked about the Wrecking Crew. Uh, last week, we celebrated Carol Kay's birthday. Uh, again, bass player to a thousand records that you didn't realize she was the musician and not the guys in the band that you thought. Jeff Porcaro is a drummer's drummer, and just listening to him on other people's albums as well as the albums of Toto, one of my all-time favorite albums, 70s albums, is an album called Silk Degrees by Boz Skaggs. If you've never heard it, just put it on. Listen to it all the way through. Some of it will sound poppy and 70s-ish, but some of it really stands the tef- test of time. Three members of Toto were actually involved in that, uh, on that album. Uh, Hungate, the bass player, and one of the keyboard players. It, it might have been Jeff Porcaro's brother, or it might have been the other keyboard player. Anyway, mm. birthday to celebrate there. Takes me back to an album I really appreciate. Now, yesterday, uh, March 31st, was... The anniversary of the date the Eiffel Tower opened. 
Mm. And of course, that was in my notes for when we was going to do the show yesterday. And all I wanted to really say about that was, well, I don't know. We could talk about that for a long time. Yeah, we can. Um, but did you know the Eiffel Tower, for example? <laughs> this will sound silly, but I didn't know this until, you know, maybe 10 years ago. The Eiffel Tower was named for Gustav Eiffel, the man who designed it. Yes. I think it was designed during a World's Fair, I believe. Yes, there was yeah. an international exhibition. Yeah. Exposition. You know, they used to do these, these World Fairs. And the city that they were held in, it was kind of like the Olympics. The city would be completely transformed yeah. for this. Buildings and would be built to be to stand there temporarily. And because, I think maybe because of that, everybody thought that Gustav Eiffel's uh, construction was not going to stand. Right. And it's... And <laughs> here we are today, and we were on just what about less than ten years ago. We were at, we actually went up to the very, very tippity top of the Eiffel Tower, where Mr. Eiffel's office was, and there were there were <laughs> there was display um, of basically wax figures or mannequins of that represented um, Gustav Eiffel sitting down talking with Mr. Thomas Edison and Mr. Thomas Edison, and, who uh, would visit him in his office yeah. that Eiffel built. In the tower. And, and Eiffel's daughter, I'm forgetting her name, but uh, Mademoiselle Eiffel, um, she was in there too. So it's it's kind of really cool. Heartily recommend <laughs> that if you're going to travel to Europe. See, some of you, half of the people in the chat right now are in Europe. So you've already been to the Eiffel Tower, right? I would hope so. I mean, if I lived in Europe or even if I lived in England, because they've got a tunnel now, right? I would be going to Paris on a regular basis. I love Paris. But it's, you know, it's... 12 hours in an airplane from where we're at and yeah. and it's not cheap either no we, so, we'll figure out we, take Robert, advantage you know we'll we'll have to figure out some way of if anybody has any um ideas for cheap travel <laughs> or we could stay at a hostel we could um we could drive to paris yeah we could drive you know we'd have to go up to alaska and then go through that's true we take a ferry um, <laughs> across the bering straits <laughs> and assuming they'll let us into kamchatka and that Putin won't try to get us to stick around. Okay, maybe that's not the way. Maybe that's not the way to do that. Incidentally, yesterday was also the day that The Matrix was released in movie theaters. And it's a... I can never remember which pill is the right pill, the blue pill, the red pill. So I actually linked to it. The red pill and the blue pill represent a choice. Now, this was interesting. This is on Wikipedia. I don't know who wrote this. But the red pill and the blue pill represent a choice between the willingness to learn a potentially unsettling or life-changing truth by taking the red pill. So I think red, reality, R, R. You guys are laughing. You probably already know this stuff. But I, I need a mnemonic. I need a memory device for that. Or remaining... In the contented experience of ordinary reality with the blue pill. Well, that's not reality then, but, you know, people use reality in funny ways. And then they say, i.e., the reality principle or the pleasure principle. Which, of course, immediately makes me think of Gary Newman. It also remind, it, it is, makes me think... Actually, it's funny because it made me think of Janet Jackson. <laughs> Pleasure Principle? Yeah, that's one of her song names. She has a song called... Okay. Yeah. Well, Gary Newman's first album after he went solo out of the Tubeway Army was yeah. also called The Pleasure Principle. Yeah. And had the song Cars. And in fact, the band Yes and uh, uh, Jeff Downs and Trevor Horn of the Buggles... Uh, knew Gary Newman and saw him driving around in his car, about which he was inspired to write the song Cars, and wrote a song called White Car, Man in a White Car. Boy, are we getting off here. But yesterday was the day The Matrix was released in movie theaters. I'm learning to have more respect for the impact of that film, even though it wasn't really my kind of thing. I don't know, I get, I get dystopia overload. Because at some point... Like, yeah, but life isn't that bad. In fact, life is kind of awesome. But, you know, you read the headlines, you read the news, you read the politics, you look at what our politicians are doing, and you look at the world stage and you see what's going on in Ukraine and you see what's going on in Israel, and then you read about conspiracies, and I don't mean the stuff folks like to make up out there, but the real ones, historical conspiracies, um, MK Ultra, Tuskegee, um, bad things have happened. 
But yeah, at some point, you're like, this is not real life. And for some of us when we were young, and you tell me in the chat if you experienced any of this, for some of us when we were young, growing up in the shadow of 1984 and Brave New World and Fahrenheit 451, and, and we and Anthem and countless books like that, it affected some of us and made us a little less ambitious. You know, we, we figured, well, you know, not just, you know, it can't happen here in St. Clair Lewis, but the ecology movement, which affected a lot of these dystopian novels, uh, Mutually Assured Destruction, which the latest Lex mm -hmm. Friedman podcast didn't do any help keeping those <laughs> memories out of my head. All the ways in which we were, oh, overpopulation, Consider Soylent Green, you know, at some point we just have to yeah, start eating each other. Population bomb by the Alvin Toffler. Population bomb. Oh, man, that was tough to grow up like that and remain an optimist. My God, I mean, all you need to do is, I mean, a lot of people back then, they didn't have access to flight. You know, it was really, really expensive back in the 70s and even the 80s. Well, only and rich so, people would go to Paris. But, but I mean, in terms of the population, oh, I right. mean, you'd, you'd fly over from Michigan to California and you look at the land down and you're like, <laughs> no, but nobody lives here in the United States. The U.S. is not populated. I hope you've had that experience. Some of you in Europe might not, it might not hit you quite as hard as it does here in the States. But you're right. We will get on an airplane to go to you know, the, the West Coast or to go to New Orleans, you know, someplace where you're flying over multiple states. And it is so green and mm. empty. Yeah. And, well, like heaven, it's downright boring. There's nothing there. There is so much more room. Now, you know, back when the population bomb was written, they believed that if the Earth ever hit 7 billion people, we would experience mass starvation. There was literally, because they did the math, there's not enough farmland to feed the world. Oh, wait. <laughs> the amount of food we can produce per acre and add to that, um, you know, not just greenhouses, but um, hydroponics. Yeah. And advanced hydroponics. This is not just raising plants in vitamin water. This is... Uh, so many different the point is there's now over 8 billion people and we have too much food <laughs> in civilized countries and in well developed countries we have more problems with obesity than we do with people not getting enough food and it ain't, it ain't changing we are using less farmland than before we could still raise the population by billions and have no problem feeding them assuming a, lot, a free, free economy is allowed so I have a little more respect for the Matrix, maybe, than I used to, than I did in the past. Hello? <laughs> but, yeah, I get dystopia. Oh, yeah, we've got noise in the background there. We have dystopia overload. I don't have any of my other devices here where I can turn that off, do I? All right, it stopped. Good. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to answer the phone there in the chat. Yes, so... If you enjoy dystopia, you know, we saw the Hunger Games and had a good time with it. Great. But the more dystopian stories I read and the more dystopian films I see, the more frustrated I get that not everybody's reaction is, oh, wow, the contrast. Oh, my gosh, how great things are. Oh, right. look at what we have avoided. We're not one step away from that stuff. Right. It's just... And I understand younger people, because you haven't been told every year or five years or 10 years or 20 years that the big economic collapse is right around the corner or the big population disaster is right around the corner or the big political collapse where the dictators take over is right around the corner. We are freer. We are healthier. We are more prosperous. Now, there are some numbers that I monitor that are just depressing. Go to usdebtclock.org, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. But my point in that regard, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, there's not a disaster right around the corner. The disaster caused by all of that economic intervention is happening right now. 
And not just the inflation that we're experiencing, not just job challenges that people are having, but the fact that as magnificent, and I do mean magnificent, as wonderful as everything is right now, as much opportunity as I have every morning that I wake up and can do nearly anything I could possibly, my heart's desire, in terms of doing things, in terms of experiencing things, in terms of going places, in terms of going to music concerts and sports events and travel and vacations and food, so many options. It's just a hard thing is saying no to all of the wonder around us. As good as all that is, it should be better. Mm-hmm. If we yeah. have, can you imagine a free economy? I know, I know. It, it's... Uh... You know how, I mean, I always thought to myself, I'd love to uh, start up a business and maybe one day I will, um, but it's, I can't, I don't know, it really, it really saddens and and disheartens me and and just just disencourages me to, to think of all of the red tape that I have to go through um, and all the extra money that I have to spend on accountants and, you know, to just just to be in compliance with the law so I don't go to jail because I created a business which should be applauded, which should be, I I mean, which should be the easiest damn thing to do in the world is to just put an organization together, have a business model, produce, um, and, you know, and work with other people and and not have to worry about, you know, how, you know, what kind of people you're hiring or, or anything like that. Just just be with people and make something good and create and profit by that effort. I mean, that's the simplest thing in the world. And, and, and I, I, it, well, it really, it pains me to think that, that that behavior is being discouraged. It is massive destruction. Yeah. At the same time, the point I'm making is don't let that stop you. Right. Uh, we still have more opportunity than ever before. And we need to capitalize on that. We need to show them that they can't stop us. Those of you who know Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged will know you've got you've got a group of people who are convinced that the country is so far gone that everybody, including the producers, needs to be fought. I try to avoid spoilers, but the point is you've also got people who are convinced that no matter what the government does, no matter what the regulators do, no matter what obstacles are put in their way, success is still open to them. And the right thing to do is the very best that you can do. I call them Team Dagny and Hank. Yeah. And I am in 2024, in the United States of America, And I think just about anywhere that I might live in the world right now, certainly Europe, and we know people in China who are of the same mindset. I think just about anywhere, the possible exception of a few places in the Middle East. Although, you know, Keith has been in Dubai recently, and even in Dubai, it's amazing for all that that's a place that should be much better than it is. Point is, as good as things should be, I am 100% Team Hank and Dagny. We are not living in the last days of the Roman Empire, and we are not living in the last chapter of Atlas Shrugged. I encourage you, if you let any of the dystopianism get you down, and especially if you let it sap any of your ambition, don't do what I did when I was a teenager. Well, I don't know if I'm going to go to college. I don't know if I'm going to do this. I don't know if I'm going to do that. No. No. Success is absolutely possible. Read more success stories, and read more fiction. This is the kind of stuff that will make you think, oh man, I only got one life. I need to make it maximum Mm -hmm. awesome. So that's what I would say about that. I feel a little bad that we missed, there were a whole bunch of really cool birthdays yesterday. Uh, Well, we could, it's um, birthday plus one, that's all. (laughs) We can can celebrate a few of these people. Well, it was Rene Descartes' birthday. Mm. Cogito ergo sum, all our friend (laughs) Paul. Ego sum ergo edificio uh, has stolen that line and used it to much better effect than <laughs> Rene did. But it was also uh, Rene. It's a, it was also Bach's birthday, the Bach, mm. you know, jo- Johann Sebastian, Johann Bach. Sebastian Bach. You know, the whole Bach family were amazing musicians, but Johann Sebastian Bach he basically created 
classical music as you we know, know it. This is one of the things I, I want to do um, is I've got actually some book of uh, box, you know, just short pieces. And there's, you know, I've got... Um, Are they arranged for alto saxophone? Yeah, they're, they're arranged for alto wow. saxophone. It's basically uh, first and second chair um, or first and second parts. Um, and I just want to record myself playing saxophone and harmonizing with that. Because, I mean, box harmonies, oh my God, they're so... Um, there's such a serenity, unlike any other music I've ever heard in my life. It's interesting because he, so good. you know, Mozart's like that. He's serene, but Bach knew when to be dissonant. And, uh, in a way, yeah. And he, so in some ways he goes deeper than Mozart, even though Mozart advanced classical music from Bach. And uh, yeah, there's nobody like Grandpa, nobody like Bach. <laughs> Grandpa Bach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And coincidentally, it was also Joseph Haydn's birthday. Mm. And Ewan McGregor. Mm. So, you know, everybody should go watch Down With Love. Yes, and everyone's like, Ian McGregor, the Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars, yeah. Anakin no, no, Skywalker. No, 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 no. Oh, no, Down he wasn't love. Anakin. He was... Uh, I forget. Why, why is the name escaping me? You can tell <laughs> he him. He was Yoda. <laughs> no, no, Yoda, Yoda's uh, student. Uh, um, you know, Alec Guinness's character. Mm, anyway, let us know in the chat. <laughs> This PR, is so PR. weird. I feel like there's this this hole in my head. Uh, his name was. Um, Somebody's gonna tell. Prince oh, Obi Wan. Obi Wan Kenobi. Oh, Obi Wan. <laughs> I watched the Obi Wan television series. It was actually pretty good. Why did that? You know, Yaren says that, and every now and then he just loses, and I'm. Yeah, no, no. That's why we have to I'm like almost, people. Uh, I'm almost Yaren's age. Oh. But that's why we have the chat because we yes. have people who are smarter than we are. Yes. Thank you, Christopher Smith. Yes. Um. But Down With Love is the best. Down With Love is the best. <laughs> I know, so I know, good. I know. He was in you know, Moulin Rouge and uh, eh. Train Spotting, you know, if you like really intense movies, but Down With Love. Oh, my God. That was fun. Renee Zellweger. So good. Silly, silly, silly <laughs> 60s style film it's made this, recently. Well, it's sparklingly silly. It is. It is. And... And, you know, all the cigarette smoking. I can't believe people still smoke cigarettes. <laughs> but they do. They're out there. And, yeah, I still remember the glory days when I didn't smoke, but my parents did in the car with the windows up and kids in the car. Sorry, oh. sorry Mom. I don't mean to criticize. <laughs> you had every right, and we, we, we tolerated it because you were the parents and we were the kids. <laughs> and that's how it works. Well, but, you know, doctors recommended smoking back then. <laughs> well, go back far enough and if they were paid enough yes uh speaking of since we're using owen mcgregor's birthday to recommend films and uh shows phil dunster also had his birth only 31 years old yesterday uh, phil dunster of course being do 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 jamie tart on <laughs> on the show ted lasso if you haven't seen the show ted lasso yet it's not too late make it happen I don't get Apple TV. Well, get Apple TV. There's, I'm sure you can get it on your cell phone. Sign up for a month. You will love this show so much you'll watch all see, three seasons yeah. within a month anyway. I forget about the Jamie Tart thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, I really enjoyed season one. And I, I liked them all, but... Well, but in season three with him and Roy Kent... <laughs> yeah. That, that... Oh, it's so good. That was good. That's so good. Yeah. So, recommended, heartily recommended, as opposed to hardly recommended. And, yeah, and listen to some songs by the English Beat and Adam and the Ants and Adam Ants Solo. Oh, my Cause God. Because we went to see them live, and they're still out there. Too cool. Oh, my God. These are people who are older than we are, and they're, like, up on stage. Adam Ant is still dancing. He's still using some he's, of his signature he's moves. He's 69 years old. He's going to be 70 in November. And oh my God! Well, he was really good. He was good. I, but I, I really enjoyed the English Beat, the English Beat with uh, David Wakeling, and um, the rest of the band all pretty much passed away. And so he has replacements for them. And they, but they sound great, including um, uh, the replacement for Rankin Roger, uh, who is Ant Anthony First Class. Imagine having a name like Anthony First, like Amy First Class, Robert First Class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, this is, this just, is, I just, the whole thing was just great. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of singer who also fills the, the sort of MC role in a band. Yeah. And 
Yeah, brings on the whole party atmosphere. Yes. My whole reason for mentioning that, other than to say, man, we had a great time, was go see live music. Get out and do things if you don't already. I know a few people who tend to say, well, I could watch that on YouTube. I got a really big t- screen TV. I can watch that on TV. And the reason I say I know people like that is because I'm like that. I, I sometimes catch myself saying, well, I've got a concert DVD. I've got four or five Rush Live DVDs. And it's sad. I've only actually seen Rush live in person once. Thank you, Steve, for that invitation. And no, nah, get out there. Get out there and be with people and do things. Get messy. Get dirty. Do stuff. Now, I did put a link to an article in the show notes, which were posted yesterday, of course. Uh, I've already broken my New Year's resolutions. Now what? <laughs> Well, it's April 1st. Yesterday would have been March 31st. Resurrect yourself. Oh. Yes, yesterday was Easter. <laughs> you For know, those put, of you who celebrate your, chocolate bunnies. You know, put on your fanciest robe and call it the Shroud of Turin. And then go on out and, re- you know, <laughs> enliven yourself. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. So, <laughs> And our, just try to jump up into the air as high as you possibly can and... And say to yourself, I'm ascending. <laughs> Damn right. You know, it's kind of like five minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer died yesterday. And tonight it's being resurrected. That's right. We, we spent a few days in the cave and uh, all of a sudden here we are. You know, one of my favorite uh, bumper stickers t-shirts says, born right the first time. Because people used to call themselves, and some people oh. still do, born again. They were raised religious, and they lost religion, and then they found religion again. It was sitting there between the sofa cushions. Yes. And so they put the born again t-shirt. Have you been born? I've been born again. I'm like, damn, I was born right the first time. Well, you know, I think that uh, there's so many possibilities and opportunities for us um, with a rational philosophy, for instance, to you know, look at the world, look at ourselves, look at our own values, look at our place in the world, and you know, just keep encouraging ourselves, enliven ourselves, find meaning, find um, find those things to really live for and be passionate about. Uh, it's it's not too hard, really. And um, you know, the only thing I regret about not being religious is. Not having an excuse to go any go someplace on you know on Easter Sunday dressed up in full Easter attire you know with a hat and things like that. I used to really love that when I was a kid. I, I don't know if if anybody any any of you remember that or if if you remember dressing up or um it, you know you're like four years old and your parents put you in a suit <laughs> whatever. I'm right. Um, but it was really really a lot of fun and there was flowers and then. After church, you'd always get the Easter basket, and um, before that, you see the Easter bunny, and it was just so much fun. Um, so I really wish that I could take those. Um, oh, what was I thinking yesterday? What's the word? Uh, reclamation. I want to make a reclamation organization of and taking all of those um, Christian elements or or whatever religious elements that you miss. And reintroducing them into some kind of structured form of, you know, whether that's, um, you know, just getting together with your local objectivists and having some sort of like outing or some sort of adventure or gathering, some kind of dinner or whatever it is, and um, kind of reintroducing those concepts because they should be ours. We shouldn't have to give them up. We really shouldn't. And uh, they were just brought such delight and joy. So, so yeah, we're, we are we are going to be uh, uh, now establishing the um, uh, the Reclamation Church of Glow. <laughs> can we just can we just have the Church of Values? Yes, the Church of Values of of earthly values. Why something. the pink shirt? <laughs> I've got to say, I don't know if Jennifer is intentionally being cheeky, but she says I love Air by Bach. Well, the Air by Bach, you you are right to love it. Uh, it's it's actually called air on the G string, which nowadays you can't really say without people kind of laughing a bit. At mm. least I do. Yeah, and air on I, the G string. I'm all for music. Ins- <laughs> I'm all for any music inspired by a G string. Oh. Uh, 
Uh, oh, by the way, Jennifer, uh, you should be happy to know that when we did karaoke the other night, Robert and I actually sang a couple of of Rush songs. Oh, that's true. W was it uh, that's time, true. time we, Stand Still? Well, we did Subdivisions first. Yeah. Because that was a song that Paul knew. Yes. Who was here at the time, one of the uh, friends that was here for karaoke. And we did Time Stand Still. Yeah. Which was a song that Paul was not that familiar with. But after doing subdivisions, you know, we, we get to talking about, yeah, I remember being a teenager. I remember being young. I remember going through all that stuff. And I said, well, I've got a Rush song, which may be my favorite Rush song, and it's a song for people our age. And Time Stand Still is that. Whether you're 30, 40, 60, 80, it may be my favorite Rush song. Mm. Cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, Jennifer, come on over, because we have Rush songs on karaoke now. Darn right. <laughs> Yeah, and Amy Mann was on that. Oh, it did was she? I she didn't did, know that. She did the background vocals. Yeah. Oh my gosh! You, you '80s people will know her from Till Tuesday. Yes. Oh, Shaj, even yes. down south, was as scary. But she, of course, the people in Canada know she went on to be very successful as a solo artist. <sighs> yeah. So pink yeah. shirt. Shall we wrap this up with the pink shirt? Uh, is there anything else I want to say, Robert? I don't know. What else you got? I don't know. Oh, you don't um, know. But I just, I, I'm like looking over. You know. Oh, Linda Cordaire is in the Facebook chat. Hey, Linda. We have the Church from. of Cordaire. Cordaire. Folks, you, you all know Cordaire.com. But if you don't, C-O-R, or if you just haven't been there for a while, yeah, I mean, it'll make some, your day. C-O-R-D-A-I-R.com. Get some inspiration. Oh, my gosh. You know, the kind of uh, reverent feeling you would feel, you know, not necessarily, I didn't really feel this way exactly, but when I was a Catholic before I was 15, um, <laughs> when all that changed, um, I just remember, you know, the, the bright liveliness and the cheerfulness and the, the sense of joyousness. Um, that's You can actually get that simply by going to Cordaire.com and looking at all the amazing art. If you happen to be in uh, Napa Valley or Jackson Hole, Wyoming, um, you can visit their on-site uh, galleries um, in person. And, um, yeah, you know, sometimes it's, it's wonder, really and, reverent. And we've interviewed Linda before. I don't think I asked her this, but, you know, you, you can go to Cordaire.com. You can see amazing art. And it really it recharges you. It refuels you. And you find things there where you're like, if I had this in my home or in my office... And I saw this every day. It would give me a boost every day. But I wonder sometimes, because you can you can see the galleries, you can there are great videos that Linda posts from the galleries. I wonder if being there with all of the art isn't almost too much. I feel like you, you would have a value explosion. It would be overwhelming. Well, it was kind of like that because they actually um, transported a lot of their um paintings and sculptures to the cincinnati there was the i'm sorry it was the austin the, the, Ocon. no wait a minute it wasn't was austin? It austin or was it <laughs> i don't remember I, I thought it was austin I austin say, Ocon. Cleveland? was they it cleveland? set up it was great they set up a mini no, it gallery in, well i was there in austin but it was also in cleveland because that was the romantic manifesto uh year then they were they were actually discussing the romantic all right manifesto. linda's gonna have to straighten us out on this yeah one. but anyway i just remember that, uh, that cleveland sure cleveland. you're right yeah you're it was right. there and john wass actually did an on-site painting it was great to see oh john there god. doing his work oh my gosh it was so good yes and 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 it was such a phenomenal thing and uh i believe that kirk barbera was a big was very very much responsible for that for transport Transporting yeah, the transportation a lot of, that. of the art. He was a, he was the hero, and, I mean, wow. and very very cool. And uh, I was talking about it being overwhelming, and Linda says, "No, it's wonderful." <laughs> well, she is the expert, and she's used to it. And as she says, she's she's taking these children, these these artistic children, and she's finding them homes. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. And uh, yeah, Linda says Kirk was our hero. So, why the pink shirt? Well, Eastern, right? Sure. Day after Easter. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> there was a time a few years ago on the social networks, on, on the Facebooks, and there was somebody on Facebook. I'm not going to name the name. You may know who this is. It was just some person. Some person. In fact, it was before the Austin Ocon because we met one of the victims of this person after that. And he put up a humorous post, but he didn't say it was humor. He put it up. 
Real men don't wear pink shirts. <laughs> and, of course, it started a conversation, which you would hope if you posted that, that you were going to start a Even if you really believed real men don't wear pink shirts, you would hope it would start a conversation. And it got more sticky, more and more shtick as it went along. And the original poster, the OP, really dug it in. And he would not, basically he would not break character. And because he wouldn't break character, he stated it stronger and stronger as the comments came in. And eventually some friendships were lost over this because he would not break character. Now there are comedians who do this, who, who their whole shtick is a certain personality. Um, I was looking at an uh, article on Scrooge, for example. I think of somebody like Bobcat Goldthwaite, who is a little like that in real life, the way that he acts as a comedian. But he's not that neurotic. He is self-aware. And he has actual friends in real life who he doesn't treat the way he treats people when and he's Robert's on stage. And Robert's not going to talk about who this person actually is. <laughs> And so, <laughs> as I watched this person who refused to let go of the joke destroy friendships, I thought, well, that, that, then I am a pink shirt objectivist. Oh, yes. th oh, this was an objectivist we're talking about. Yes, you're a copper pot. I'm a copper pot objectivist, objectivist, and I'm a pink shirt objectivist. Yes. And the reason I, I say that is, this is not my post-it note for the week, but it, it's an old one. And it's the name of the book that I've worked on, not as much as I should. Values are primary. If you are letting your shtick be so much a part of your personal identity that you're willing to lose friendships over it, or you're willing to lose jobs over it, or you're willing to not even try because of it, I want you to think twice about that. If you are at a point in your life where you have obstacles that are primarily because... Oh, I'm not that kind of person. Uh, whether, and I'm not talking about moral issues where I, I don't lie, I don't cheat. I'm talking about courage or bravery or creativity or panache. Think twice about that. If you are, if you have a shtick online, a personality such that there are certain things you would like to say in earnest, but you won't because you won't break character. I want you to think twice about that. But especially if you have anything that is holding you back, but you are clinging tightly to something from the past, consider letting it go. Values are primary. You know, there, there are things about me, the Robert Nacer persona. Yeah, not really. I don't really have a persona. But there are things about me that I almost hate to... Well, for example, the, I'm not wearing the black jacket, red t-shirt. And the first couple times I did this show without a black jacket and a red t-shirt, I thought, wait a minute, that's that's kind of the shtick. That's what I do. And the first 75 or 100 episodes of this show was black jacket, red t-shirt. Yeah. And then at some point you've got to say, wait, 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 wait. That had its value. It could still have its value. But it's getting in the way of something else that I care more about. And a tiny example, irrelevant, not important, but... I've watched this stop people or watched it affect relationships, and it doesn't need to. Values are primary. It's what I take away from Easter, the season of rebirth, the season of resurrecting yourself. I think of, every time I think of resurrect, I think respect. Respect yourself. Well, respect isn't something you do to yourself. It's something you do to other people or other people should do to you. Well, no, actually, you should respect for yourself. Except now I think resurrect yourself. Be reborn. Well, don't be reborn. But, you know, find little things where you think, I'm not that kind of... Wait, that's a handicap I've imposed on myself. I can be that... I'm going to be that kind of person. I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to overcome that obstacle. And the reason is, and this is the real post-it note for the week, if you want to live well, you need to live well. If you've decided... Uh, well, I'm just not up for that. 
I'm not up for changing jobs, changing careers, or I've got some handicap that actually stops me from working for a living, or I've got psychological challenges, and I need to get over all those psychological challenges before I you know, pursue a career or even a job, or I've got this thing that's keeping me from seeking this relationship, or this thing, this, this, I get it. We've all got stuff, and I don't want to be guilty of toxic positivity and say, well, if you just try harder, you get everything you want. But I also know that it's true that the vast majority of our limitations are self-imposed. And most of us, certainly by the time you reach my age, we have a whole long list of things we've decided we are never going to do. Or things we've tried once and it didn't work out and we're never going to try again. So I hope that springtime, I hope that Easter, I hope April 1st or March 31st, is a good time for you to say, you know, let me think twice about that. Let me try that again. Or let me reconsider that thing I thought, oh, I'm just not that kind of guy. No, let's do it. Yeah. Spring is coming, summer is coming. If you're south of the equator, winter is coming, and it's time to try even harder. But, yes, spring is here. Let's make it awesome. We'll talk more about it as we go on. Kind of a light topic for a Monday night because we missed our Easter show, but I am glad. Glad that you are here. Glad that you joined us. Thank you for all the comments in the chat, especially the chat always makes it. Even yes. though Amy does a much better job answering the chat than I do. Favorite part of the show. Amy, did you have anything else you wanted to say or anything else in the chat you wanted to address oh, I just want before to thank everybody, we wrap up? Everybody for for the chats. Aren't they just um, the best? They're the best. You are the best. Oh my gosh. And I listen to other I, podcasts I mean, and, and I know and what their audiences are like. You I'm guys are to, the best. I'm trying to find it, but Robin actually had a few zingers. <laughs> thank you, Robin, for that. the few zingers. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my newest quote is, um, I used to enjoy Catholicism, but then I turned 15. <laughs> That's good. That's really great. That's good. Yeah, I used, to, I used to believe in God, but I'm not superstitious anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well you but know. Then, then I found an actual uh, reality-based morality that yeah. helps me tremendously. And uh, yeah, Heinlein I'm, said, one man's religion is another man's belly laugh. I think that's a little rude depending on who you're talking to, but I yeah. totally get it. You know, folks, if, if if you are religious, well, I probably don't have anything to say about that, but I don't mean to be offensive to our folks in the audience who are religious. I'm going to guess the majority of the people who listen to this show aren't, but I know that some of you are, and, you know, more power or higher power to you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, you know, I, I really wish, though, that there was such a thing. I was watching an old episode of Xena, the Warrior Princess, uh -huh. uh, the other night. Xena, Warrior Princess. <laughs> and one of, the, uh, one of the plots involved ambrosia, the food of the gods. And ambrosia was, you know, buried deep in some mystical cave of some it, temple. I forget, that, I forget, did it give you powers? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, well, nobody got powers in the episode. Spoiler alert. But, um, but yeah, it was so silly, uh, the whole thing. The whole show is very silly, but so super fun, and I love Lucy Lawless and Renee O'Connor. And um, anyway, so uh, uh, yeah, Ambrosia. You would think that if there were, <laughs> I would if there was a god or gods, I would really would like to have Ambrosia too, because then you know mortals could have a chance at immortality and becoming a god. That would be nice. If we live forever, we might <laughs> run out of food. <laughs> Actually, that's the funny thing is even if we lived forever, we wouldn't run out of food because if you live forever, you produce longer. As long as yeah, you stay productive, that's true. No problems. I guess I guess I wouldn't necessarily want to live forever, would I? I would. Well, mm. it depends on what health you get to. You know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. If you were um, completely if I can healthy all the time and not degrading. <laughs> yeah. If I can keep the health of a fifty-year-old guy. Or, yep. you know, if they can turn back the clock and then give you the health of a 22-year-old guy, mm -hmm. which I tend to think of as sort of the ideal or epitome. I don't know. The reality would probably be some mix. Yeah. Once we get to that point, we'll see if we get there before our uh, time clocks expire. Folks, thanks for joining us. 
running a little longer than expected. I thought this would be a quick one. And I am glad you are here. We'll do it again on Sunday, normal days. Um, but we had to get this one in because we have you know a few schedule irregularities coming up too. Don't want to miss any shows. Don't want to miss the chance to talk to you all. Don't want to miss the chance to come through for our patrons. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, patrons. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, messes. No, thank you, patrons, for thank supporting you, the show. If you want to support the show, go to robertnacer.com and you will find a link. Both to patreon.com, folks who want to support us monthly, or the PayPal, one-time contributions through PayPal. That would be awesome, too. And with that said, all that is left is to wish you a happy day after Easter. You know, I'm not into pranks. I love a good joke. I do love a good joke. So, by all means, I like to, I like have to, fun with your April right, 1st. Right. Whatever. Whatever works for you. Well, I, I like there to not be so much time in between the joke and the and the payoff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> pranks tend to be mean-spirited unless you're pulling them on people who like pranks. And yes. some people do. And they're like, oh, you, you figured out how to drop that bucket of water on my head. Ha, ha, ha. I'm going to get you. <laughs> yeah, and then they'll get back at you. That's yes. cool. Yeah. And people who are have that sensibility. Yeah. If you pull that stuff on me, on the other hand, I will find you on the internet. I will hack your computer. I will make <laughs> your computer spit money at me. Or something. I don't know. What, what does an IT guy do to, to uh, threaten people? I won't really threaten you. I'll probably forgive you because Easter and it's a Christian holiday. No. <laughs> now we're just babbling. Or just kill Sorry, me. Guys. Okay, that's right. We, <laughs> We were ending the show. Why are we still talking? Leave. Go. Get out. It's like the end of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You're still here? <laughs> what? It's over. Go Go home. All uh, right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. That's it. We wish you success. We wish you flourishing. We wish you all the joy that you so richly deserve. And as always, we wish you.